Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first seminar of 2022. My name is Jocelyn, and I'm the research facilitator at DFP. Before we begin, I'd like to invite you to introduce yourself in the chat and to tell us what native territory you are joining us from. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that DFP's offices and classrooms are located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Unpacking the terminology in this statement, traditional recognizes land traditionally used and or occupied by the Musqueam people or other First Nations in other parts of the country. Ancestral recognizes land that is handed down from generation to generation, and unceded refers to land that was not turned over to the Crown or government by a treaty or other agreement. To learn more, please take a look at the links listed below. Uh, the DFP Steering Committee has put together a great lineup of speakers this term, so please take note and add them to your calendar. We have upcoming seminars on February 23rd with Professor Parang Irani from UBC Okanagan, March 9th with Assistant Professor Samia Somanath from UVic, and April 13th with Assistant Professors Lillian Hung and Kristen Haas from the School of Nursing at UBC. Today we have not one but four speakers who as a team co-designed a platform for youth to access a range of healthcare at Foundry BC. Foundry is a province-wide network of integrated health and social service centers for young people ages 12 to 24. They provide a one-stop shop for young people to access mental health care, substance use services, and family peer support. They have centers all across BC with eight more on the way. Foundry has disrupted the healthcare system in regards to youth and strives to break down the stigma of mental health and substance abuse. Today's speakers will share their two year long journey designing the Foundry BC platform. Their methods of design are very relevant to us in the DFP community as they designed both for and with the end users, including young adults, their families and caregivers and healthcare providers. Niha Ude is the product strategy and innovation leader at Foundry and loves working at the intersection of healthcare and technology. Sudeep Jassar is the Community Development Liaison at Foundry. She is passionate about equity, mental health, and community development. Alicia Raimundo is a project manager at Foundry working on virtual care. They have 10 years of experience building online low barrier programming and youth engagement programs. And finally, Suhail Nanji is a project lead in virtual care at Foundry and is especially interested in the transition to digitally enabled healthcare systems. I'll now turn things over to our speakers. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Um, I'm Sukhdeep and I will introduce ourselves as we go. So my name is Sukhdeep. I am the Community Development Liaison at Foundry and uh, I use she, her pronouns. I am fortunate to live near the village of Sanauk, which I'm learning more about. Um, and I'm on the unceded, occupied, and unsurrendered territories of the Coast Salish people, including Musqueam, Squamish, Stolo, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I, uh, I like to start off with just a more grounded acknowledgement in my own personal ancestry. So I'm a second generation settler. I was raised in a family that settled in colonized lands for orcharding use. At the same time, I was raised to respect nature and lived a very seasonal lifestyle in harmony with plant cycles. I uh, was raised in the, the land of the silk speaking nations. Moving to the next slide, we will be doing a brief introduction to Foundry. So thank you so much for the introduction, Jocelyn. I don't know how much more I have to do. Um, we'll do an overview of our journey into the virtual app, as well as uh, discussions on the, the structures, the partnerships and the procedures that have followed the, the design and training. Um, and we will have a demo and then we'll, we'll leave quite a bit of room for discussion and questions. That's our goal today. Next. So as Jocelyn mentioned, our vision is to really transform access to health and social services for youth and families across the province. We, with virtual, that's really been able to transform our, our reach so we can reach communities in, we can reach youth in multiple communities. Um, our mission is to support youth in, li in living a very good life. We started the process in 2014, 2015 with our first round of funding. Um, 
we highly believe that every door is the right door in Foundry, rather than the wrong door and ushering people used into multiple places. When we launched, our focus was transforming access, um, but we've also now been highly focused on including equity in how we're transforming access to services. And we're committed to that in both our service provision and in our culture in our, our across our network and within our own organization. We are committed to learning and evolving alongside our youth. That's one one thing that we value quite deeply. Yeah, sorry, Neha, go ahead. <laughs> so as Jocelyn mentioned, we have eight centers across the province. You can see where we are located currently. The green dots are the currently open centers and the orange are coming soon. I hope they are up to date. Um, it is helpful to understand that we are 11 centers um, and that we have the eight coming in the, in the coming year. Sorry, we have 11 open centers. Our local communities have local adv youth advisory committees and family caregiver advisory committees that are all involved in varying levels of decision making, advocacy, and engagement. We also have provincial advisory committees from youth and caregiver perspectives um, that guide our work at central office. Within Foundry Centers, we offer multiple services in one location. We offer, as, as here, these integrated services in peer support, social services, including employment services, substance use support, and just a note that we use the language substance use rather than substance abuse uh, at Foundry, uh, mental health supports, and physical health support. We optimize resources by integrating services and bringing together core services and supports. We offer, um, sorry, our goal is to reach young people earlier before their health concerns have severe impact on their health and well-being. Um, we provide the right support for what each young person needs when they need it. So that's really critical to our success and that uh, people need different levels of service and care at different points in their life and their journey. We are a team of care and service providers. So you'll notice that all of these five pillars are surrounding youth in the center. And we really focus on integrating our communication uh, channels and our information across the sectors. Um, and we really strive to ensure that our services meet the changing needs of young people across our province. So we recognize that that does change quite quickly in this world that we live in. In terms of co-design and working alongside youth, uh, one, of the, one of the key places you can see success for us is our brand and the length of time and the engagement that we, uh, we went through in designing our boundary brand, which is shared across our centers. That took a year for us to develop and um, we engage with many different youth in this process. When we work with a center in a local community in designing their center, youth and families are engaged right from the beginning as our local service providers in creating a center that meets the needs of that community. So this is a co-design in progress in our physical spaces, and this will lead to the rest of the conversation. Next. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> and so as we were mentioning that we have our physical centers, we have the virtual app. We also have foundrybc.ca in which we work with uh, BC Children's Hospital. Uh, they support a website for, full of information, resources, blogs that are designed, like we have blog updates and things like that that are designed by youth. Um, we, this content is developed with youth clinical experts, foundry staff, and our community partners. And it really, it showcases the way that we work in collaboration and co-design um, and how that, in, that is integral to foundry at large. So now we'll move over to our journey to virtual, which COVID, I think we had our, in our heart to have virtual services for a long time and COVID really uh, forced us to pivot and start providing services. Uh, virtually. So I'll pass it on to Neha, who can introduce herself if she likes. If you'd like to further introduce yourself, you do not have to. Thank you, Silk. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm hoping to give you a brief summary of our journey and really narrowing it down right now, as Silk said, to our platform and also speak a little bit to where we are now. So when we started at the very beginning, 
through some of the other project work that we were doing, we heard a need for a PHR for young people. That's a personal health record for young people, some place that they could store and access their health information. So what we did was we partnered with an organization that had access to a PHR product in order to begin this journey. And as Suk alluded to in her slides, we put youth voice in the center of everything that we do. So we weren't gonna invest into anything further without hearing directly from our young people. What we did was we partnered with two of our foundry centers. And as Suk already mentioned, each foundry center has their own youth and family council. So we partnered with them to get access to their youth and family councils. And we did co-design workshops. Al, our wonderful Al led that, and they will speak more to that process on the following slides. And so what we learned from this is that um, young people weren't willing to put any information into a system if it wasn't being reviewed by or looked at by a healthcare provider on the other side. So they really wanted the PHR to be connected to their care journey. So an example that I can give you is when we were working with them, we heard that during a session or as an outcome to the sessions that they have, they are as foundry service providers, they have some goals or action items that they come up with. Now, this is written on paper and handed over to the young person. And we know that there are issues with this, right? So the paper gets lost or there's no way for them to track their progress and say like what's working for them and what's not. So this, this is just one example of some of the things that came up. And then the other thing that we heard is they were looking for easier ways to connect with their healthcare providers. So we did hear about young people from rural remote communities having to ferry into their nearest family center in order to access services. Or uh, another example is some young people switch between locations, right? Either like it's for school, they're living in one area for school and then they go back to their hometown for holidays or they live with their mom during school days and then they live with their dad during vacation time. So there was no way to continuously access uh, services at a foundry center during, during these transitions. And so this was high level what we heard and we took these needs back to the organization that we partnered with and we learned very soon that the PHR that they had developed or they had, they had access to was more traditional in the sense it didn't allow for collaboration between a young person and a service provider and that it wouldn't be able to meet those needs. So we had to, we had, there we decided to like not move forward with that partnership. And then we did a whole bunch of research to see what, what products may be out there that we could use that may be able to meet these needs. And again, to, to highlight, this was about two and a half years ago when the tech landscape was very different. With COVID, a lot has changed. And so at that point, we didn't find anything that would actually meet these needs. So we made a very bold decision. And I say bold because we're not a development house, right? So we made this bold decision to build a product from scratch. And um, so our partners on this project are the Ministry of Health. They were the ones who were funding this project and they were on board. I think they also realized this, that there was nothing that could meet this, this need and, and hence we began our journey. And, um, and so I kind of covered like our pivot. So our, we had to pivot, we had to change our goal and because uh, we realized that what we needed to build was more than just a PHR. We needed to understand how we could make services more easily accessible and how we can also improve the in-person experience with this platform that we were building. And um, what happened next is COVID hit and we had to make some quick decisions. So young people could no longer access in-person services the way that they did. And at this point, they needed it more than ever before. So what we did at this point is we set up a foundry virtual team of service providers that came together from across the province. And what we decided to do was build this platform to start with for this team of service providers. So they, they could use this platform to provide services to young people. And, um, and um, that's kind of where we are at now. And some next steps is we want to take this, obviously that's where we started. We want to put this back in the hands of our centers so they're able to utilize this platform as well. And then we have an ever-growing backlog with a whole bunch of requirements and requests that have come from our service providers, from our young people that we want to continue to build and develop going to move on to the next slide. So right now, our platform has really, um, for our young people to interact, our young people can interact with our platform while the iOS app, uh, there's an Android app as well. And for those that don't have a smartphone, they can interact with it using a web app. And then our service providers interact with the platform through a clinical or a staff portal, and that is web-based. 
So this is the big picture right now, right? So we have, as I mentioned, um, a virtual team, we're called Foundry Virtual VC, that enables young people to access services between, uh, young people within the ages of 12 to 24 to access um, services virtually. So basically what we did is we took a Foundry Center and we made it available online. And this improves access and reduces barriers for young people who may not have access to these services in their community, who are unable to access in-person services, for a lot of reasons, and um, or who just may be comfortable accessing services in person um, due to COVID, and then um, also provides it, it. It also opens up an avenue for young people who prefer support online rather than in person. That's just a quick like visual. So we do provide um, drop-in counseling, one one to one peer support, as well as groups, and. Um, I just wanted to highlight too that the entire process was very agile. So we didn't develop all of this all at once. So it was it was not just the platform, but also the program. So we probably, we first introduced booked counseling. Then we introduced our drop-in model. Then we introduced groups. So it was very iterative. And so, and we got continuous feedback from our young people as we build out each of these phases. And I'm gonna pass it on now to Al to speak to the co-design. I'm skipping those slides in the middle because I realized that I went over a little bit. Okay, over to you, Al. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Neha. So um, I'm not going to speak to this slide, so you can just go to the next one. Um, there we go. So uh, so my name is Al, um, and I use they, them pronouns. Um, I came to work for Foundry um, as somebody who has built uh, online uh, virtual care technology before. And one of the ways that I have done that that's really important to me is through something called co-design. And so to um, it was interesting to me because I wanted to build um, the kind of technology that I wanted to use when I was younger, but I also wanted people to, I wanted to build it with the young people and family of today so that it would land for them. I've, I think we've all seen a lot of technologies and stuff like that that seem like really good ideas on paper, but didn't work in collaboration with with their end users and it ends up failing. Um, and so it was really important for us to uh, to create a youth council and to work with family members as well as our service providers um, to co-design a platform that would work for everyone. And so here on the screen, I just have the hearts ladder of participation. So this is all of the different ways that you can bring um, young people on, onto your project. And for us, we really aimed at um, being somewhere between rung six and rung eight um, during this project, that there's stuff that, uh, that there was scope and things set by, um, by our funders and what we can do before we need to deliver it. So it, it wouldn't be like a true, true co-design thing, but that we did, we did our best to co-design everything that we could. Um, and how we ended up starting this is we put a application out to the province um, asking for young people who wanted to help us uh, design the this platform, which consists of two uh, two apps, an iOS app and an Android app, a web platform and a clinical portal. Um, and so we put that call out. We got about 80 responses um, and we uh, really prioritized wanting people, uh, young people from rural and remote communities um, and wanting uh, people with lived experience. And so in mental health, that just means someone who's struggled with mental health and or addiction issues. Um, and, uh, and so that, that they would be somebody who would want to use this platform. Um, we also uh, wanted to make sure that there was lots of, uh, we also wanted, with that diversity, we really wanted to make sure that we were meeting people where they were at. And so meeting folks, um, giving them many different ways of participating. Uh, we've done all of our engagement over, um, over Zoom and Microsoft Teams before it was cool um, because they're all over the province. Um, and so being able to allow people to turn on their camera or not if they want, could contribute over chat, contribute over email and kind of meet them where they're at. We also, it's also incredibly important for us um, to compensate young people and families who are helping co-design our platforms. Um, and we do that because without that compensation piece, um, it, it isn't co-design um, because it, uh, the service providers and the people like me and Neha are being paid to do this work. And there's just a big difference between 
what about the youth volunteering their time and other folks not and so that power imbalance becomes it becomes really hard to do true co design at that point. Um, and so uh, we from from once we had all of these amazing people on our youngest young person was 12 years old our oldest uh, young person which is a funny statement, it was uh, 24. Um, and we, from that point on, we just started uh, talking to them about what they wanted this platform to be. And um, it, we got them to work with our uh, app designers. They drafted out what they wanted certain features to look like. Um, they, every, all the content and the images and everything that you will see in the app when I walk you through it is something that young, the young people helped make the decision uh, about and um, were consulted on and in, enjoyed and also from a tech perspective, but also for us, like the clinical perspective is just as important. And so we, they help, the, the young people have also helped uh, us shape programs and groups and stuff like that over uh, time. Um, some practical things, we, uh, the, the youth council, uh, they signed up to meet once a month. Uh, it's about a four hour uh, commitment, um, but uh, it's, they also are super open to meet more than that or less than that as the work ebbs and flows. You're not, I don't always have stuff for them to, look at and do um, and uh, and yeah and we we have we, we will keep the youth council going for a long time for me it's really important that we brought them on before there was any code written um, and before like uh, and where they could you know tell us to change our mind about things there's been decisions that um, other people don't like uh, that other people have questioned me on that I was just like hey I'm just listening to what the young people want <laughs> and and giving them that one of the things and I'll show the feature later but we have a feature called inbox that allows asynchronous messaging between service providers and their and their young people and families and um, the young people had asked that they don't see read receipts or typing indicators about their service provider because they don't want to be left on read by a service provider so and I had to defend that decision like 20 million times, but uh, <laughs> but it is a it's something that um, you may not be able to guess that that would be what the requirement would be until you actually talk to them. Um, yeah, we we also uh, our youth council is like I said, rural and remote, but it's also about 50% indigenous um, just really wanting to make sure that that perspective uh, was represented. Um, the other thing is that. Uh, True co-design takes time and effort and, and you have to make space in somebody's role to be able to do it well um, and be able to do the translation in a tech project anyway between um, what the young people are telling me uh, to what we tell the developers and then also for what the young people are telling me to how I explain it to our leadership. Um, and just being able to uh, understand everybody involved and translate <laughs> as need be uh, to everybody involved. Um, I want to quickly just read what's on the screen here, which is um, uh, a quote from one of our young people, um, a young person by the name of Sydney, and it just says, being part of a, a youth advisory committee at Foundry has been an unforgettable experience. It's meant a lot to me because I have personal struggles with mental illness and building our Foundry virtual quizlet has positively impacted me and my mental health by giving me a sense of purpose. I feel so lucky to be part of this process and been given an opportunity to speak up for what's in, something that's important to me. Um, and so that's it's it's been super awesome to just uh, create a space uh, for them to help us make this the best possible thing it could be. Um, and, and sometimes that's having hard conversations. Your young people and your stakeholders are not going to agree um and it's okay to hold all of those contradicting requirements in your hands at once and and sort it through uh, by having some hard conversations i know my youth council trusts me because they'll tell me when i'm wrong and when they don't like my ideas um and the fact that young people feel safe to do that i think is a big uh is a big step um one other thing that is um, unique to the way that I practice co-design and I've done it for this project is I do not mix my stakeholder groups together. Um, I will engage young people, families, and service providers all separate of each other. Um, and that's just mostly to create space for people to ask for what they want because it's my my job and our team's job to sort through that and to prioritize that based on, on uh, where things are going and just being transparent with folks. Um, one of the other things that I uh, really that we've done here that I would really that I really tell you folks to do is just to be as transparent with your young people and your family members and whoever you're co-designing with 
as possible, letting them know like why a particular why a feature isn't in the app or like, oh, this is like you can get this this feature that you want, like gamification, but you're gonna have to lose these three other things to be able to do that. Um, and then also just being super honest about where the hard boundaries are, where are the things that they can influence and where are the things that have been pre-decided uh, for um, for them and allow and just allow them to have a clear idea of their uh, sphere of influence. Um, I will say that we've, we have a huge age difference and huge difference in terms of like school journey and work journey and everybody has gotten really well, gotten along really well together. I think sometimes people try to over plan and separate the younger and the older folks. Um, and I would say that, uh, with you, when you have a good group and everyone trusts each other, that that's not really necessary. Um, and that you just work on creating that safe space and the group cares about each other. And so they'll, if someone's confused, they'll explain it. And if, and it creates a nice um, and awesome community. Um, so I think that's kind of uh, it for what I was gonna say on this. I don't, I, Neha has been involved in this project with me. So I wanted to let her know, that, uh, ask her if there's anything she wanted to add. You covered everything out. <laughs> um, just and just quickly to touch on the training piece of this. So we, um, so we, there's a couple of training showed up in a couple of different ways. We had to train our uh, developers to work with our young people, um, and we have to train and any other service provider that uh, wants to have connection to the youth council. There is a training aspect that will happen there as well. Um, you don't need to train your young people. They figure it out, especially around technology. They understand it very quickly. Um, and uh, and the other thing that we really had to do is our service providers um, are trained to work in person, um, and they don't touch a lot of technology in their training and in their schools. So they don't. They we've spent a lot of time and and support just making sure that they are set up correctly to feel comfortable in the day-to-day -day tasks that they do with their jobs. Working on a computer is new for them. Working with Zoom and a bunch of different technologies is new for them. So it was really important for us to create space for them to ask any question, create really good documentation and, um, and kind of just meet them where they're at um, and, and make sure that there's folks around to support them with that. That is kind of it for me. Did we want to move in? I don't know if we have a slide for the demo, but let me know where the right place to do that is, folks. I wonder, Suhail, do you want to speak to your slides and then I'll go into the demo or? Yeah, that makes sense. Let's do that. Cool. Oh, a little audible, that's okay. Um, do you want to switch slides on here? Yeah, I'll be really quickly quick here because um, the demo and actually seeing the platform, I think, is the most valuable thing for, for folks here because it's, it's a pretty awesome platform. Um, and so just kind of reflecting on some of the the outcomes of doing kind of proper code design and what we've been able to do in terms of um, adoption of the platform and the app. And so um, I think the team has alluded to, so behind the app currently, so we have the Foundry BC technology and behind that is a Foundry virtual BC team, which we'll talk about a little bit in a couple of slides, but this is, the, this is almost like a virtual center. So to talk about our brick and mortar centers across BC, the 11 centers. We also have a Foundry virtual center that's serving um, youth aged 12 to 24 and their caregivers across BC. And so these numbers, um, it's important to contextualize that because that are the services that are coming through the technology, um, which is probably the most value add proposition of this technology. And so here, here's just a quick slide to show uh, February um, 2021, that was our soft launch. Um, so that's when we go, went, go live with our Foundry PC platform. And before that, we had our intern solution. And what's interesting, it's actually not on this slide, but before um, the go live, um, just reflecting on creating a, a low friction experience for our youth and, and accessing our services. Because at the beginning of our, uh, when we launched it initially in March 2020, right when COVID started, uh, we knew the demand for youth mental health was very high. And unfortunately, it just continued to grow. But we weren't seeing that adoption with this interim solution. 
And I think we reflected on that because we didn't create a low friction experience from the beginning and we were doing the best that we could at the time, but that low friction experience, um, so we had manual booking and we were not getting that demand that we thought we were gonna see. But when we started optimizing experience, um, even with the interim solution and then with the platform uh, where we've co-designed it with, we're seeing this cumulative growth that you're seeing on this chart here. Um, and so just kind of key milestone there was May. That's when we had a public announcement um, with, as mentioned, our partner, our strong partner with this is the PC government. So the Minister, uh, Minister Malcolmson, the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions uh, made an announcement and got picked up by, I think, was it 12 uh, news outlets across uh, BC um, talking about the service. So we've seen this cumulative growth. Right now, this is a bit dated, but we have about 5,000 uh, users that have registered. So it means they've downloaded it and they've signed up for a service. Doesn't mean that they've accessed services, but they've signed up in our toolbox platform. Uh, so around 5,000-ish, including youth and caregivers, um, and then about 8,000 sessions that have been booked through um, our platform. And so, yeah, we're getting this good adoption, and I think that's a huge factor is the co-design. So adoption is one thing, so in terms of the utilization, but what is the qualitative feedback that we're getting? And fortunately, we're getting the same. We're getting consistent good feedback that 100% youth agree um, that there's easy access to service, it's easy technology to use, um, they were satisfied with the experience. And that's really important as we're hearing this digital front door experience and then linking them up, up with services. So that was a survey in March 27, uh, March 2021. We just did another youth experience survey and the, the data is tracking to be the same, which is, which is great, fantastic. Just quickly go to the next slide. So here, here's a who, like who, who's accessing our services? So we said that 5,000-ish. Um, ends are a little bit different here, just who could be these, these, uh, the feedback within the platform. Uh, when we ask these questions around demographics, but just to give you an idea of who's asking this across BC. So age, uh, again, our services offer 12 to 24. So we're seeing 54% of 19 to 24 year olds, 28% 16 to 18, and 12 to 15 year olds with 18%. So we have a bit of work to do there in terms of building a little bit more awareness for the young folks. Uh, we certainly know that they need it. And, um, some strategies that we're looking at within that Foundry Virtual uh, Service kind of project team is uh, certainly getting in schools and, and really communicating um, that this service is available and free uh, to, to all youth uh, across BC that fit within that age range. And then just moving counterclockwise here, sexual orientation. We're, we're, we're I would say, proud in terms of the diversity that we're, we're seeing within sexual orientation, and that's being intentional. Um, so we have, uh, Al talked about that we're co-designing our services with our, our, our service providers and our youth as well. And so um, we're seeing that um, 40, only 47% identify as heterosexual and more than 50% don't identify as heterosexual um, for the youth that are accessing our services, and in part because of the services that we provide. And so a lot of this, we have youth-led groups um, like Queer Cafe, um, and we have strong philosophies that these groups that are really highly engaged and are reaching rural remote communities and populations that are led by youth that identify as queer as well. And so we're giving this authentic experience um, through our services and through our platform that way. Um, I could speak a lot about that because I'm really passionate about the data about, but we have some um, time limits. But if you have any questions, looking for them after. Um, and just going down to ethnic cultural background, again, this is across BC, so this is an aggregate of uh, the, the youth that are accessing our services across BC. Um, what's interesting, if you deep dive into this data, for example, interior health, um, the youth that identify as Indigenous, that's actually 18%. And so what we're doing is we're reflecting on this data and really doing deep dives on what are we doing well there? Um, is it just, is it a population difference or are we doing something different? So are we, are we reaching local community center there that we are to maybe um, on the island, for example? Um, so some work to do there in terms of diversifying uh, our, our ethnic and cultural background with the team. Um, and then moving right to the last point here, probably the, the most important question that we have, and probably our, our true North Star for the program and, and virtual health in itself uh, is access. And so this is a really meaningful question that we're asking. And we found out that 31% um, of the youth, uh, when asked when they asked after they've asked us access our services, um, so they wouldn't have gone anywhere. They wouldn't have gone anywhere to access um, supports or formal supports or services. So that means three out of 10 youth um, wouldn't have accessed services in, in BC. So that's a really important number that we're keeping track of. And 
And it's a success metric for us, and we really need to keep looking at that. So last slide for myself, and then we'll move into the exciting uh, demo. And so I think it's really important to, to highlight the, the, the team on, on the other side of the technology and the platform. So we've done this tech co-design with the technology and platform, which has been phenomenal. Um, and then also we have this other team on, on, the, on the other side that are just as phenomenal. Um, and they really provide a lot of feedback in the technology. And this is just like the quick idea of the diversity of our team. We have youth peer support, family peer support, clinical counselors, program support system, primary care, which is our nurse practitioners, uh, vocational rehab counselors. And so they were a big part of this. So we launched this in the middle of a pandemic, a brand new technology. So we had to really listen to their feedback and be humble and create, a, create a, hopefully a culture of psychological safety that they feel comfortable in knowing that we're going to fail. And please give us feedback. And that has happened. And we continue to use that agile approach. It's like, give us feedback and, and we'll try to implement in, that, in the platform to make your life easier to ultimately serve our youth across BC, the phenomenal work that you're doing. And um, we've seen that with like a cool one was Al mentioned that inbox feature. So that's a cool one that has synergies between what the youth wanted and the staff because they were going in the walking queue and it's like, oh, these youth are waiting in the, in the walking queue. Um, they're waiting for 10 minutes. We have no way to actually message them within this, our integrated Zoom platform. And so we built this uh, based on their feedback. Well, not me, Neha, uh, Al, and, and our freshman designer. And so it's really been cool to see that um, co-design with our services and, and them championing it as well and, and taking ownership of the platform because they've had a huge part in, in what it looks like as well. The last one, maybe cool to do during a lunchtime, but I don't know if it looks too appetizing, but it's meant to be a hybrid uh, pear, apple, orange. And it's just to talk about our next steps and uh, Neha alluded this. And we're going to have to use these principles of co-design and it's, a, it's an audacious goal, but I think we could certainly do it. Um, is we want to bring this app to, to um, brick and mortar centers now because we purpose built this app for uh, a virtual, purely virtual team. And, and so now we will take this platform into that hybrid model of in-person services and virtual because if we know virtual is not going away after the pandemic, um, it's, it's too valuable for our healthcare system. And so we will, we will maintain those principles of co-design and learn with the foundry centers on how to do this in this hybrid model. I'm really excited for that next endeavor. All right, hopefully that was fast enough. I'll pass it over to Al for this really exciting thing. <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just take the last couple. I'm not, I won't do it uh, super, super thoroughly, but I will take the last uh, couple seconds here just to show you what it is that we've built. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. There we go. Okay. And so this is the Foundry uh, BC app. This is on an iOS device. We have an Android device and a web uh, way of accessing it as well, as I've mentioned previously. Um, prior to a login, uh, the young people wanted some information that they could just access without creating an account. Um, and so this is uh, information from our website that is uh, that they can search and look through. Um, and this is handy because as our website team updates our website, we are able to, uh, this will just update automatically. Um, they can also access the urgent tab without a, without a sign in, and this allows them to access any urgent resources if they're experiencing a crisis. Um, and, uh, all of this is, uh, like a uh, hyperlinked, so you can just click and call, um, into the crisis resources, um, from here. Um, the, the rest of our features require, requires a sign in. Um, so I will sign in and do that. Um, you'll notice now that on what we call the Foundry tab, which is the home page, there's now this little cloud download icon. So um, young people let us know that they don't always, uh, they usually have smartphones, they might be old, but they don't always have data plans. And so this is to allow them to uh, save stuff for offline viewing um, and be able to read through some articles as they're walking to a Foundry Center or um, uh, chilling outside. And so that's uh, that was one something that's changed here. Now the um, connect tab has opened up. Uh, so this is all of the different ways it can connect with a service provider. Um, and so drop in is similar to like walk in at your primary care, like at your doctor, they can see a counselor or a peer supporter that day. 
Um, scheduled appointment, we allow our, our young people to schedule directly into the uh, calendars of our service providers um, for counseling and peer support. And we did that because young people told us that there was that the phone call and making booking really difficult was too big of a barrier and they just weren't going to engage that way. Um, and so we've built it so that they can book into the calendars of the service providers. Um, they can sign up for a group, uh, view their schedule and look at the inbox feature. So um, I have planted a, uh, a uh, sample counseling appointment here. So if I click on it, um, I'm able to launch the meeting uh, from my phone um, and it will pop me into a waiting room. Um, we can't start more than one Zoom instance at a time, so I can't put you in here, but basically this is a, uh, a API with Zoom and, um, and the young person can choose either a video appointment where they just keep their video on, audio where they turn their video off and just talk or chat where they disconnect the audio, disconnect the video and just chat. Um, and that's the ways that they uh, can connect in. The service provider can launch this from the clinical portal and uh, let the young person into the session. Um, and you're also able to call into sessions um, if you are in a place where you don't have the greatest of Wi-Fi. Uh, we have built this app to be as light as possible. That's something else that we've heard, especially with a lot of young people in rural and remote communities, that their Wi-Fi and their data isn't the greatest even if they have it. So um, having something that is emphasize and taking up as least space on their phone as possible, as well as a light, at least amount of resources to be able to use it well. Um, so from here, you will also see the inbox. So inbox is a functionality. Uh, we noticed that a lot of our young people, um, when service providers try to get in touch with them over email or and I mean, this is not a surprise to anyone, call anybody. <laughs> they were having not a lot of success uh, being able to connect. So we created this asynchronous messaging system that allows service providers to open conversations with young people. Um, young people cannot open conversations with service providers and the service providers are kind of in control of the conversation. They can close them when they want to, uh, open them when they want to, and, um, and see that additional information like explained earlier uh, about when the young person is, has read their message. So this is what I've sent <laughs> sent from the service provider account. Uh, and once and once the service provider and the youth have had their conversation, the service provider can close this. The youth will be able to view it for an hour, um, and then the conversation will disappear. Um, and uh, one of the features that is really exciting to a lot of folks is a feature called My Story. Um, what this is, is young people and family members have told us that they're really frustrated about having to retell their story every time they see a new service provider and that it's traumatizing for them. So this is a place where they can write their story in their own words um, and upload a picture and it'll be shared with the service providers ahead of the appointment. Um, we made it so that this, the, the character limits on here is like about five, like it would take no less than five minutes, no more than five minutes to read so that you, this, we can, the service providers can read it in a pre-buffer time we give them ahead of their appointments to be able to look at this kind of stuff and just cut down on having to retell your story. Um, and you can write a, a bunch of stories um, and then whatever one you share and you press this little share icon will pop up at the top and uh, you will, and that will be the one that the service provider will see ahead of the session. Um, this is this is something that it's been really cool to watch people pick up and use. Um, one of the things that's really awesome uh, for me is just seeing young people using this app in the places that they feel safe. Um, it could be that they're at home in their pajamas. Um, it could be that they're at the beach. It could be that they're on a walk. We've kind of seen it all. <laughs> um, and I think it's really awesome uh, that with thanks to the collaboration we've done with young people and families and service providers that this app is something they feel comfortable using where they feel safe. Um, and so, yeah, that's it. That's my, my quick uh, demo. There's a lot more complicated features on the service provider side. I'm not gonna get into it right now, <laughs> but, uh, but that's uh, the basics of what this app does. Thank you. So uh, I, that sounds like it's a, a good spot th that you've decided to end and left lots of time for questions. Uh, thank you for a fantastic 
uh, presentation. Wonderful to see you all. Uh, so it, it, the, we'll open the floor to questions. We always start our session though to privilege the students on the call. So uh, those of you who are trainees, if you'd like to either put your hand up or put something in the chat, I'll try to do two things at once. Um, and Joss can help me if I forget somebody. Okay, so I've I've given I hope a sufficient amount of time. Oh, and I see a hand up from Sky, who is not a trainee but a colleague of mine. So I think I've given us a fair a fair gap there. So go ahead, Sky, if you want to start. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I just wanted to thank this team, and it's, it's just an honor to work with them uh, every day. And I I'm sort of asking a question that I know the answer to, but I was hoping that you could highlight for this presentation about how you considered equity, diversity, and inclusion in all your planning. Um, and I'm wondering, Soup Deep, even of some of the AROC work that we could discuss, because I think it's been something that I've been really grateful to learn from this team on, and there's been such careful consideration of it throughout, and wondering if you could just speak to a couple of places about where it's been important from your pre-planning, implementation, and any areas of quality improvement you're thinking about. Well, I, I, so I can't speak to the virtual app piece. I think that's the, the Suhail and Al and Neha expertise, but um, just a, a brief introduction to the anti-racism organizational change work we're doing at Foundry Central Office that I think does have implications to um, just the way that say Suhail was thinking about uh, pieces of work and Suhail, you can speak to that as well. Our, within our Foundry Central Office, so that's our backbone organization, um, which Foundry Virtual is connected with and as is our network. We heard from youth across our, our local advisory committees, plus our provincial advisory committee that we really needed to make changes to address um, racism and, and healthcare. And we've seen that in the In Plain Sight report, we've seen that in um, the Black Lives Matter movement that is emerging and ongoing. Um, and we've seen that in the increase in anti-Asian racism in BC. So knowing that we needed to make changes and that we're a part of a much larger system. And as you could tell, we're, we're connected to multiple systems in Foundry, uh, multiple ministries, multiple uh, nonprofit organizations. We really thought it was uh, important for us to do that here in our backbone organization, take a look at what we could do to make our structure safer um, and to make our staff as uh, safe as possible. And that I think had some implications, but I wouldn't take too much credit because Al uh, themselves is an incredible individual who has been working in equity, diversity, and inclusion, I would say for the majority of their career, if not prior to. So Al, if you wanna respond to how the engagement process was like a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. We, um, we are like, a one of the things that it's really important, and I um, I wish I had the link to it right now, but I use something called like a smoothie uh, uh, approach to youth engagement. Um, and what that is, is the ability after every kind of meeting and engagement to ask people like to be constantly out being out or agile and iterating on it and asking people what's working really well, what's not working well. Um, and, uh, try to address those things and constantly be improving. And so um, surveys after meetings have been really important for us to give that opportunity um, and then also create the safe space to do that. As much as possible, I also try to have fun. Um, so I think that all my surveys, there's a question at the end that's like, tell me a bad joke and people have, <laughs> or like, tell me whatever's on your mind. And I've read anonymous rants and gotten some really bad dad jokes and it's great. Um, and, uh, and I think doing that has created a space where people feel really comfortable to, uh, to um, let me know if they're, if they have an idea, if they're having an issue and or just, or just if they're appreciating something um, to be able to, uh, to do that. Um, and I, I also don't, um, I also don't like push our youth to disclose anything that they're not comfortable with disclosing. Um, and so 
like uh, so that I just kind of create the space for them. And if they want to show up and say that they're a service user, then they can do that. If they want to, if they don't want to say anything, then they don't have to. Um, and uh, and yeah, that's I think the biggest thing is just constantly like getting feedback and iterating on it and um, creating constantly creating that safe space for people to be vulnerable. Um, with you. The other thing that's really important to know about uh, youth engagement and family engagements is that sometimes uh, good hellos and good goodbyes are equally important. And sometimes people are going to, for whatever's going on in their own life, um, want to say goodbye uh, to being involved in something. And um, it's important to, you know, open yourself up to feedback if there is any, but just, um, you know, give them, give them a good goodbye um, and, and let them go on their way. Uh, young people are transient and they're going to change like we've we've had we've lost people we've gained people and um, and it's okay and just for that to happen. Um, I do just since I'm talking um, data and privacy is really important to our young people they've asked us a bunch of questions about it being secure and safe and whatever they're doing in schools to teach people about data privacy is working. Uh, we, we definitely got some questions, even from our youngest youth council members around what we were doing to make sure that their information was safe and secure. Um, and so that, that's something that really matters um, to them and is something that they pay attention to and, and care about. Great, thank you. So there were a couple of other questions before that one. Um, I'll go back and get those. So um, Heather asked um, that you'd, you'd gotten survey responses from the youth, but what has been the feedback from service providers? Um, our service providers uh, are like, we've gotten a lot of really positive feedback. We've also gotten a lot of like, asks for um, for things to change on the app and um, and we will always take that in and uh, depending on the severity and how urgent they see they see it is we will uh, we will prioritize it based on that um, and but they uh, they have very close to a single sign-on experience now um, and they really enjoy that and they really enjoy being able to like using the zoom platform and the information that they're able to see um, and yeah, I think um, I think it's always the service providers are used to having the most privilege in this space. So I think it's always just a learning around um, around realizing that like their perspective is important, but it's not more important um, than the young person and families. And so that's been, I think, a, learn, a back and forth that I've had with with our team. Yeah, I'll just add there to um, Lisa is. Um, it was really difficult, like launching a whole new platform in the middle of a pandemic. And I think what we did and what Al did is um, when I was the operations lead for the team is we had team meetings every Tuesday and we created a cadence, especially before we were just before we were launching and Friday meetings actually. So almost twice a week where we'd create space if they had any questions or feedback, we launch a new feature. Do you have questions or feedback? And then just creating a, a full transparency with the team and, and hey, like we would like to prioritize this. And if we're not going to prioritize it or it's not going to make the backlog and we're going to prioritize something else, we need to be transparent on why it didn't make it and why this item was prioritized before that. Um, so I think those philosophies of transparency were really important. And I think they just appreciated that, like having a little bit of um, um, decisions on, on how things were being developed as well. Was really important. Also, can I add to what Suhail said? I think the other thing is uh, in terms of support, right? Because again, our young people will learn the platform really fast. But with our service providers, they don't, that's not their, they aren't, they aren't trained in using technology. So I think in the beginning when we launched, we had our program support assistance. That's our front desk staff really supporting them on the platform. And then that wasn't enough because it was, it was almost a full-time job and they couldn't, it's not something somebody can do off as a side. So then what we did is we hired somebody who does just tech support. So all they do, their role is to support the service writer. So if a question comes up, this person's always available to be able to answer these questions almost immediately, right? And I feel like that's very important when you're trying to get technology updates. So that was one big change. I, and I think that has worked really well. And the other piece is when we onboard our service providers, apart from the training, because there's so many platforms that we use. So apart from that training on how to use the platform, we also introduced this, um, this 
one-on-one -on -one kind of demo. So you're like our tech support person pretends to be a young person and the service provider does a demo session with them even before they go in and start providing services. And that's really helped to build confidence as well. And these are all things that we've learned as we've gone, right? So we hadn't, we hadn't done this before, so it's all learning. I feel like those are some of the pieces. So just really acknowledging that they need that support to be able to um, really, I think, accept the platform. Thank you. Okay, the next question is, considering the remote communities aspect, what was the biggest challenge for developing the solution? Not regarding the developmental process, but the features and healthcare process behind the app functioning. I can... I was, I, I think, I, now I'm really curious about your perspective on this too, but I'll just also say, one of the things that's, um, so we offer, we have a, a we have lots of services that we offer, but it's not infinite. Um, and so in rural and remote communities, it's, um, there's a lot of, like, we work being able to refer people out to things in a lot of rural and remote communities, there isn't anything else there. Um, so that's been uh, something that I think folks have had a hard time. And also just the making um, phone an option for unstable Wi-Fi and unstable internet. I know that the province of BC is working to get good internet out to a lot of the smaller communities, but that's not something that they all have access to. So being able to API with something like Zoom and its call-in options um, has been helpful for folks uh, to be able to call in, or if somebody really wants a phone call, we have an ability to offer appointments, just like one, two people phoning each other, like outside of the platform and have taught people how to, uh, how to support that. So um, that's, that's one of the two things that come to mind for me. Go ahead, Neha. I'm gonna add a little bit to the tech perspective, right? So what we made sure we were doing was building a lightweight app, something that can work even on like low Wi-Fi or low bandwidth, right? So that was really important to us. So when we made any technology-wise decisions, we made sure we were we weren't like increasing also the size that's on all, all the platform itself, right? So young people don't have too much space on their phones as well. They don't have like the latest models. So I think the size of the app that was another piece. And then I think when we started, we were going to do just start with the mobile apps and then lag the web apps behind, lag the web app behind. But then because we had rural remote young people in our, in our co-design sessions, and we learned straight away that that wasn't gonna apply, we had to like do the web as well. And I think that's where prioritization comes into place. There are so many more features that we could have gotten in if we had delayed the web. But I think we made a decision to be like, no, the web is just as important. And so we have to reduce some of the other features. So we were making sure that all of these three platforms move together, move forward together. And then I'm trying to think, um, I think the other point that also I think Al already brought up is just being open to modality, right? Like audio, you, you don't have bandwidth for video, that's fine, switch to audio. You don't have bandwidth, bandwidth for audio, we'll do a chat only session or you can phone in. So I feel like those pieces, um, were also things that we learned because I think in the beginning we were going to go forward with just with not so many options and then that really drove instead of building something from scratch we were like no to build something from scratch is going to take a lot of money we're just going to integrate our platform with Zoom so a lot of those decisions came from those co-design sessions and that feedback that we got from our young people. One of the one of the ways and, and I think Sue Hill was there for this conversation but one of the ways in which we've prioritized a, a desire of our young people kind of like maybe over a service provider is that we do offer chat appointments. Our service providers don't like chat appointments because uh, it's a newer modality for them. Um, but the young people who choose chat are the least likely to choose anything else. Um, and, uh, and it's really cool to watch over time as they become comfortable. Uh, maybe they might turn on their audio or maybe they might turn on their video. And we've seen some people be really nervous and then like 15 minutes into a session, they're having a video call. So it's, it's really important to meet people uh, in, in where they're at. Okay, I think we have a, a microsecond left for one more question. Um, wondering if you had any tech company as an industrial partner. We do. We actually skipped that slide because I was I took too much time. So we're working with Freshworks right now. Um, they're um, they're based in Victoria, and so that, those are the guys who are building everything for us. We've had a wonderful experience so far with them. Yes. Great. 
Um, I can stay on, can, can the team stay for a few more minutes? There's still 40 people hanging out here. So I'm, we want to be respectful of your time though. There were just a couple more questions. You okay to go ahead for five more minutes, say? Heads nodding, okay. Um, your work is, oh, hang on. I'm wondering about continuity of care. Sounds like it's unworkable for kids to see the same caregiver repeatedly, develop relationship and go deeper. Love the stories. Have you tried anything else to address this hard problem? We are like we, um, so you can speak more to this, but we are a short, a sh like a short term service Like people can't see us infinitely forever. Um, but they do search, um, they can't, they do choose a service provider that they book with. So if there's somebody, if they have a want to see a, a guy or if they have a particular uh, counselor that they just want to like wait and see if they can get in with that person, they can do that. That's functionally available to them. Um, but it is, but we, we are short term. So it's, there is a limit on the amount of times they can see somebody. Uh, I don't know if you want to add anything, Sarah. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think um, there's two pieces that come to mind. There's the technology and then there's the people and partnership. And I think, um, what we're realizing there is some uh, there's some technology uh, functionality that we can leverage to inform to um, further enhance the continuity of care because we have three elements of continuity of care in healthcare which could be informational continuity the relationship um, and then some of the processes as well and so just focusing on that informational continuity say we have this foundry dc platform and all the foundry centers across bc and with the foundry virtual pc team and we have clients that are going through um, uh, different centers, we can certainly have some opportunities for informational continuity and those transitions and those warm transitions um, ideally will be cleaner and warmer. Um, but let's say there's there's organizations and communities that, that are not using virtual and we're, we're transitioning to um, in-person services in a rural remote community. This is where we're really working on like the founders uh, virtual service BC team um, is partnerships. And so working with FNHA, the First Nations Health Authority, um, getting into those communities that we just don't know, we, we know that uh, youth are not accessing our services and there's no foundry brick and mortar center there is um, there. So how do we reach those folks? Uh, we need to build partnerships. We need to be on the ground. COVID has certainly made that challenging, but these are thought processes that we're having now is we need to get out there um, and, and really build some of these partnerships. And so that's some really exciting work we're doing as well. And it is a, it is a challenge, certainly and a lot of work, but very important work. Naya, did you want to address that as well? I'm just going to add quickly to that. So we have done some work. It's not too much, but it's a start. And I feel like we have to keep moving in that direction. But um, just so we have a platform, and it's called Toolbox, that all of our service providers use across the foundry across all of our foundry centers. So that's a platform that we've integrated into our foundry BC platform. So that supports continue, continued, continuity of care at at least a level um, where if you wanna know if a young person's accessed multiple foundry centers, that database that will actually tell you that this young person has accessed these different centers and these are the service providers that they've seen and these are the services that they've accessed. And it also reduces the need for the young person to re-answer certain questions or surveys, right? So you see all of the data that uh, Suhail shared, that's all coming out of our toolbox system because it's integrated into our BC platform. And so let's say I'm accessing Foundry Virtual and I've answered all of these surveys, I've finished doing them. When I go into Foundry Richmond, let's say, and, access, and I'm, I'm not gonna be asked to do those surveys again because they kind of become available because that platform talks to all of the centers and it also talks to our Foundry BC platform. So we've started to, we've just, I guess I'm gonna say we've just, it's just the tip of the iceberg, not even the tip, the tip of the tip of the iceberg. I think there's a lot more work that needs to be want, done as Suhail um, spoke to it, but I feel like it's a good start, I guess. Great, um, I, I wanted, I hope that you can, um, look at some of the wonderful comments in the chat where I think we're going to need to come to a close here. So I would love to, I'd love to thank you all for coming today. Um, amazing, amazing work. Um, Sky has put her uh, email in the chat if you are interested in collaborating with them. Um, and they're, they're always happy to reach out and work with other groups of folks. And I think the folks in DFP are a really great match in a lot of ways for helping uh, move this kind of work forward. So thank you all very much for your amazing work, uh, your thoughtful process. 
um, attention to equity, diversity, justice, inclusion. We appreciate it and we appreciate your willingness to come and share that knowledge with us today. So thank you. I hope you all stay very well, as well as possible under these trying times. Um, and I hope to hear from you in the future.